an outline of what I'll be presenting to you today. I'm going to talk a little bit about why it's important to have a good grasp on the seaweed flora of the Hawaiian Islands, why it's important that we're able to identify species, um, talk about some of the difficulties and the challenges identifying tools, uh, identifying algae using the tools that we have readily available today, the morphological tools, and some of the advantages that we can have by using molecular characterization techniques. Why are we focusing on the green algae instead of any of the other groups that are out there? And talk a little bit about what we're aiming to provide with the results from this year's Hickory Project. Okay, so in 2004, Isabella Abbott and John Huseman published what we have now is the foremost compendium of green algae in the state of Hawaii. Um, they recorded approximately 110 species of green algae known from marine and brackish water environments around the Hawaiian Islands, which is a reasonably diverse flora for a tropical region. Now, identifying these based on morphology has been the status quo up until now. Everything that was done in this book up here was based on morphology. Um, but what we're finding with this project and what a number of researchers are finding, of course, over the last decade or so, is that using molecular techniques in addition to morphology can sometimes reveal a lot of discrepancies in the taxonomy and in some cases um, lead to a lot of systematic revision. And that's sort of a theme that you'll see recurring throughout the talk today, that we took a fairly simplistic approach in this project um, and we, in the end, discovered that there's a huge amount of work yet to be done before we can fully come to the conclusion of this project. Okay, now morphological identification requires a lot of time and taxonomic expertise. Um, it can take years sometimes to become a taxonomic expert in a particular group. It also sometimes requires characters that are absent for much of the year. So even if you do have the expertise to be able to identify species, you just might be out of luck if you happen to obtain your collections at a time of year when the samples were not fertile. Okay, so there are many cases where you can only identify things to genus, even if you are an expert in that particular group. So what can molecular characterization do for us? Well, this can help in identification of algae if we have a suitable DNA sequence framework already established. That is, we have a series of specimens that have been expertly identified and they are matching up to very specific clades using these molecular tools. This is the sort of technique that relies on the molecules inside of the algae, that is the DNA, rather than their morphology. Um, and it can circumvent some problems with morphological identification. Now this is a project that was designed to complement some of the ongoing efforts that we have in the lab. We have a rather large project to characterize the red algal flora of the Hawaiian Islands, which is rather more speciose than the green algae. There are approximately 370 species of red algae. We're also looking at the brown algae, which are somewhat less than the green algae, about 60 to 70 species. Um, and some of the tools that I'll be showing you, we've developed to be able to use throughout all of these different characterizations. Okay. There are some potential uses for molecular characterization systems that make this an important project and an important tool. For example, we can use the results to identify new species or records if we already have a good baseline of these molecular signatures for the species that we have here. We can use these techniques for rapid detection of invasive species or strains of species. An example of that would be uh, the invasive strain of Calerpetaxifolia um, and many other green algae that are invasive in other parts of the world. Um, we can also use it to determine the floristic composition of a region or a sampling area. So one of the aims that we are um, striving towards is to eventually be able to go out and collect a community sample um, from a reef or from any other habitat that might have a wide variety of algae living in it, and then be able to use these tools to come up with essentially a species list of what is in that sample. And we're relatively close to that. Okay, so over the past year I've given us series of presentations to Hickory about the results from this project. And we've been looking at a number of different markers. Uh, we've had a lot of trouble with the green algae. There are some markers that work relatively well. There are many that don't. So what I'll be talking about today are the four that we have a reasonable amount of data for, and I'll focus in on a subset of these that we believe are probably the most promising for assessing the green algae of the Hawaiian Islands and probably other locations as well. I'd like to say, though, that when we first proposed this project, what we were doing was um, proposing a relatively simplistic approach that built on the DNA barcoding effort. Um, and for those of you that aren't familiar with this, it's an effort that aims to characterize species using a single um, locus. So essentially a, a short gene region. Most animal species um, are using the mitochondrial CO1 gene. Some algal groups work relatively well with this marker as well. Uh, for example, the red algae and the brown algae. Uh, the green algae really do not work well with that marker. And so what we were doing was more or less waiting to see what the 
barcoding efforts were coming up with for regions for the green algae and for the land plants. Um, so several years later, they still haven't come up with anything. They've come up with a whole list of things they're still trying and testing. There are a lot of problems associated with the green algae and with the higher plants. Um, so we've just more or less had to go on and find some things ourselves and test them out. Okay, but what we were aiming to do was represent more than one of the genomes inside of these algae with our marker assessments. So that is to say, we have DNA present in the nucleus, the mitochondria, and the plastid in these algae. We wanted to make sure that we had some representation um, across more than one of these regions. Okay, so you can see that we have two plastid regions that we were working with and two nuclear regions that we were working with. The first plastid region is a partial 23S rRNA region, uh, which is universally amplifying, so it's a good candidate for us to use. The second region is the Rubisco large subunit, RBCL gene. This is really commonly used in higher plant work as well as green algal phylogenetic research. Uh, for the nuclear regions, we were looking at the 28S rRNA or the LSU gene, uh, a fragment of that, I should say, and also the internal transcribed spacers, and this is a region that is commonly used for phylogenetics at the species level for green algae. Okay, so we collected approximately 250 <coughs> field specimens from um, most of the main Hawaiian islands. We also obtained some specimens from the Census of Marine Life Expedition to French Frigate Shoals. And we also did a lot of work over here at Bishop Museum. So we collected um, 90 green algal specimens from here, representing 47 different species. Okay. There are several different aspects to this project. One is characterizing these species based on uh, their morphology and creating some vouchers that we can keep long term. So we can always go back to the morphology and try to match up our molecular results as we continue to work through the systematics of these groups. So the herbarium sheet photography um, is ongoing for our field collections, but they are all made. All of these vouchers is complete for the Bishop Museum specimens that we've been working on. Um, we're still finishing up the formalin voucher photography, but all of these vouchers are made, they're labeled, um, and they're available to be worked on. One of the exciting parts of this project was the establishment of a database where we could put together all of the aspects of this project that we're working on. And the database construction is complete and the entry of the green algal data is still ongoing, but we do have most of it in there. I'll show you really briefly a little bit about this database. This was funded through our National Science Foundation grant to analyze the red algae of the Hawaiian Islands, but we created it with a lot of flexibility so that we could expand it and include um, other collections as we worked on these different aspects of the flora. So this is the Hawaiian algal database. These are all the people that are working on it. I'd like to say that it was primarily designed by Norman Wang, who is a graduate student with Garnot Presting and MBBE. Um, and Garnot had a, a large hand in this project as well. So this is set up. So we have all of the taxonomic information along the left-hand side of this database screen. It brings up a thumbnail image, the first one, and it is put in in terms of photographs for the specimen. Each of these pages is for a single specimen that we're looking at. Um, each of these are united by a unique accession number that we keep within our laboratory so we can keep track of the DNA extracts, all the sequence data, PCR products, uh, morphological vouchers, they all have the same number on them for the same specimen. Lots of information in terms of the collecting site, the date collected, who collected it, who identified it, where it's retained. We have some notes on where uh, it was collected in the habitat, the sorts of um, environmental characteristics that were present at the time of collection. All of these collections are georeferenced, so it's linked into Yahoo Maps, and it's going to bring up a map of the area where it was collected. So this um, representative that I'm showing you here was collected at Black Point on Oahu. We have a number of uh, photographs that can be inserted into the database, and these can be at any scale or any level, so it can be a whole specimen photograph. We also have a number of microscope photographs. So the idea being that you can click on any one of these images and it'll bring up a larger image of that and you can download that, you can use it, you can get an idea of what this looks like under the microscope. We've also got the DNA sequence data included in this database. So if you were to click on uh, these sequence file names, it's going to bring up who assembled it, what region it is. We have a file name associated with it so we can organize the data and the actual sequence is included in there as well. Okay, so this database is complete, it's constructed, uh, it's going to be going online, so it will be internet accessible by fall of this year. Okay, now we also wanted to um, be able to incorporate some samples from resource managers to help, eventually, help them to identify some of these samples, because these are rather tricky and difficult, as you'll see. 